All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our RBT practice exam series. We're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please subscribe for all of our updates. Check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass the exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. During a group activity, a child completes the first step of a task and then immediately moves to the last step, skipping several intermediate steps in between. The instructor sees the child doing this and decides to help the child through the task by adding props after certain steps to ensure all steps are completed sequentially. This teaching strategy is most similar to what? So we have a task chain question here. And as the RBT, you're going to be typically concerned with implementing and teaching using the task chain. We know the task analysis is what we use to create the task chain by breaking down behaviors into steps. In this case, the question wants to know what type of teaching strategy are we using? We have a child who completes the first step of a task and then skips to the last step. As a result, the instructor does what? Well, the instructor is going to help the child through the whole task, but only helping on certain steps. So essentially, in order to make sure all the steps are completed in order, the instructor is going to have the child complete the full task chain, only prompting after certain steps. And so if we're going to teach a task chain entirely and not stop at the first step or start at the last step, what would we call that? A, forward chaining. With forward chaining, the instructor is not going to let the child go through the whole task chain they're going to start with that first step and then prompt every step after that. In this case, the child or the instructor is going through the entire chain all at once and only prompting after certain steps. Same thing with backwards chaining. If we were going to use backwards chaining, we would start at the last step while prompting from the beginning. We're not doing that here. We're starting from the beginning, but the instructor is letting the child do the entire chain, only prompting after certain steps. So what the instructor is using would be considered total task chaining, where we're teaching this entire task all at once and only prompting as necessary. We might use total task chaining if we have a quick learner, if we already know most of the steps, because it allows us and the learner to do the entire chain where we're only providing prompts really as necessary. And that's what the instructor is doing here. And then a behavior chain interruption strategy would be a method of using an already known task chain, interrupting at certain steps to try to evoke new behaviors. We're not doing that here. We're not interrupting the chain. We're still teaching. So the teaching strategy we're using here would be considered total task chaining, where we're teaching the chain all at once and only prompting after the necessary steps. The world record for hot dogs eaten in 10 minutes is 76 hot dogs. If you wanted to measure the rate at which the hot dogs were eaten, what would that rate be? All right, we have a pretty straightforward rate question here. And what is rate? Rate is simply frequency over time. So if you need to find rate, all you're going to try to do is determine what is my frequency, what is my time. In this case, our frequency is going to be 76. 76 hot dogs to be specific. Our time is going to be 10 minutes. And so the question wants to know, what is the rate at what hot dogs were eaten? Well, simply put, all we need to do now is put 76 over 10. We're going to divide our frequency over our time. And when we do that, what do we get? A, 10 hot dogs per minute. 10 hot dogs per minute will be the equivalent of 80 hot dogs. And that's not what we have. We have 76 hot dogs. What we're looking at is B, 7.6 hot dogs per minute. Again, how did we get that? We simply divided frequency over time, which is how you get rate. 76 hot dogs per minute, obviously not because we ate 76 hot dogs in 10 minutes. And then 7.6 hot dogs per 10 minutes. No, because we ate 76 hot dogs in 10 minutes, which is the equivalent of 7.6 hot dogs per minute. Don't be afraid of the little bit of math. Rate is not complicated. And all we need to do is find our frequency, divide it by our time, and that's going to simply give us our rate. And the key word with rate is typically per. So if you see something per something, 
in other words, frequency per time, you're typically going to be dealing with a rate type measurement. Alex is monitoring a group of 10-year-olds who all want to jump on the mini trampoline. Alex says they each get one minute on the trampoline and then the next kid gets to jump. If the kid's waiting is the behavior and jumping is the consequence, and Alex always uses this system effectively to get the kids to wait, what type of consequence is this? Interesting consequence question because it kind of lays it all out for you. It's specifically identifying what's our behavior, what's our consequence. And we know consequences affect behavior. And so we want to know how has the behavior changed following the consequence? Well, the kids waiting is our behavior. And Alex always uses this system to get the kids to wait. So it's clearly effective. The consequence is jumping. And so clearly the jumping consequence is effective at getting the kids to wait, either maintaining that behavior or increasing that behavior. So if we have a consequence that is maintaining or increasing behavior, we have a reinforcing consequence. That's what reinforcement is. It maintains or increases behavior. In this case, our behavior was waiting. The jumping is the consequence. And so the jumping is maintaining or increasing the waiting. The rest of the information isn't necessarily important in this type of question. It doesn't matter how old the kids are. It doesn't matter about the one minute because the question is specifically asking about the consequence. It's why we always spend so much time in the question first, because we really want to understand what's important. What are we trying to understand? What is that question asking? So with that said, what type of consequence is this? We've already determined it's reinforcement. So now we need to ask ourselves, is it going to be positive or negative? Well, the consequence is jumping. So the opportunity to jump is added as the consequence. Since it's added, we would consider that positive. So if we look at A, positive reinforcement, we put those things together, that's going to be our answer. It's not going to be B, positive punishment, because it's not punishment, because we increased our behavior. It's not going to be C, negative reinforcement, because the consequence isn't taking away something. It's providing the opportunity to do something. And it won't be D, negative punishment, because it isn't negative and it's not punishment. So the consequence we're looking at here is positive reinforcement. A student was taught to use a visual schedule to transition between activities more smoothly. Initially, the student required verbal prompts to follow the schedule, but now transitions smoothly by only referring to the different visual cues. The teacher was able to achieve this by reinforcing in the presence of different discriminative stimuli. What could you describe the teacher's technique as? Now, this question sounds much more technical than it really is. Okay, we're looking at the teacher's technique, and we know she was reinforcing in the presence of different discriminative stimuli, or SDs. But if we look up here, right, we have this student who was taught to use a visual schedule. Initially, they needed verbal prompts, but now they don't need verbal prompts, only visual cues. If we go from needing a certain amount of prompts to not needing a certain amount of prompts, what can we call that? Well, we can call that prompt fading. We faded out those prompts. So if we look at A, that looks to be our answer. However, we also have B, stimulus transfer control. And stimulus transfer control is essentially prompt fading. We are taking the control from one SD and putting it to another. So with the teacher, by reinforcing in the presence of different SDs, she's transferring control from one discriminative stimuli to another. And that's what we're doing with prompt fading. We're transferring control from prompt to prompt to prompt to hopefully the real SD. So A and B both look good. C, task analysis. Task analysis has nothing to do with this question. It's why fluency is so important because if you're fluent, you know task analysis has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. Very easy to eliminate. What we're trying to do here or what we have done or what the teacher has done is faded the prompts and transferred stimulus control. So our answer is going to be both A and B. If you get stimulus transfer control confused, just think prompt fading. If you wanted to pick a functionally equivalent replacement behavior for escape maintained hair pulling, what would be the best strategy? All right, this phrase functionally equivalent is the key here. And when we talk about functional equivalence, what are we referring to? Two, we are referring to behaviors that serve the same 
purpose serve the same function. When we choose replacement behaviors, we really want to get functional equivalent as possible because the whole reason we're removing a behavior is because it's typically not socially valid or it's an issue. However, it's still meeting a need. In this case, hair pulling is help to helping the person escape. If we're going to pick a functionally equivalent behavior, we need another behavior that's going to lead to some sort of escape or avoidance. So A, pick a behavior that will better help the learner gain access to items and food. That would be more along the lines of a tangible, right? We're looking for escape. B, pick a behavior that will help the client calm themselves down when frustrated. Not necessarily going to help the escape function. C, pick a behavior that will help the client achieve escape appropriately. There you go. Very straightforward, very simple answer. This new behavior meets the same function as the old behavior. They're functionally equivalent. And then D, pick a behavior that competes with hair pulling. We're not too worried about competing with hair pulling. We just want a behavior that's the equivalent of the escape maintained hair pulling behavior we're getting rid of. So C is going to be our best answer. Pick a behavior that will help the client achieve escape appropriately. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.